So I'm continuing the uh, Decently and in Order series. I took a bit of a break. Uh, we, I preached on uh, the importance of praying, and then I taught on the reprobate doctrine, which tied in neatly with Jeremiah chapter 6. So we're back into it, and uh, today we're going to be looking at the order of the church or the local church. I like using the term the local church. If you ever wonder why do so many Baptists say the local church? The idea behind that is because there is that false teaching that there is one universal church. That, you know, every saved person belongs to sort of this one church body. And the Roman Catholics love that. That They love that idea because they think that, you know, salvation is through one church. It is through their church. And so if they just sign you up, if you just get registered, if you just get kind of inducted into their religion, you know, whether I think it's like by baptism, what is it that uh, gives you, that gets you as a member of the Catholic Church? Is it baptism or is it something else? It's a sprinkling? It's a sprinkling or whatever it is. Right? They, they think they've got all these, all, all these church members and they think you've got to be part of this one universal church. But you'll soon see that that's not what church is. Church is not just some, some global body where people don't interact with one another. In fact, churches are at a local level. And many times when we read about the Bible, yes, you know, sometimes God uses the word church. But when, when the, if it's just the one church, it's describing every church. Many times you're going to see the term churches. Or, you know, um, uh, different cities having different churches. And so this is where we get the idea of a local church. You know, for, for you guys, Blessed Hope Baptist Church is your local church. Hey, there are other churches. There are, there are other good churches in Sydney. You know, I, I don't pretend to be like, oh man, we're the only one great church. I think that's a really prideful attitude to have. You know, there are a lot of great churches uh, that have served the Lord uh, in this city. A lot of great soul winners still getting out there preaching the gospel. And so there are many churches in Sydney. I think it's the best. But anyway, <laughs> there are many great churches in Sydney. And so, you know, we want to get this idea, like, what, what, why is church so important? What is, what is church? And if we look there in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16, just a, a, a reminder for us in Colossians 1, chapter 16, it says, For by Him, that's by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now, often we think about what God created. We think about, yeah, the heavens, the earth, the creation. Yeah, we get that idea. But then it says this, what else is created? Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And so in this Decently and In Order series, we've looked at the workplace or the employment. We've looked at government. We've looked at family. Hey, all, and now we're going to be looking at the local church. Hey, all of these things have some level of dominion, uh, principalities. All, all of these institutions have some element of power. And understand that even these powers were put in place by Jesus Christ. They were created for Him. All right? Created by Him and for Him. This is why I've been teaching you that every institution, whether it's a godly man or an ungodly man at the top of it, they are still all answerable to Jesus Christ. Okay? If they do well, if they follow the laws of God, if they practice things properly, how God uh, asks, they're going to be blessed. Hey, but if they're corrupt, we deal with a corrupt government, you know, corrupt politicians, hey, even corrupt churches, hey, even messed up families where fathers aren't leading their house properly, you know, whatever level it is, brethren, Jesus Christ is in charge of that. And if they mess things up, Jesus was going to hold them accountable. Jesus is going to judge those people. All right? Now let's keep going. Verse number 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now we get to the church. Verse number 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So who is the head of the body of the church? Jesus Christ. It's not your pastor. It's not your pastor. Okay? Please don't treat me like the head of this church. Please don't treat me like I'm some type of God man. I am, I am just like you, brethren. I am just another human being. All right? You don't have to come and ask me uh, for permission to do things in your life or in your family. Listen, as, as the head of your home's husbands, you're in charge of your family. You decide what you do with your family. You know, don't come and ask me what kind of job should I do. Pastor Kevin, I've got this, I've got this uh, uh, potential job offer. I've got this potential job offer. Which do you think I should take? That's not for me to decide. Okay? Go to God. God is the head of the church. God is the head of every institution. Okay? Jesus Christ is the head of all things. And look, it says here at the end of verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
Okay, so when we come to church, the one that gets the preeminence, the one that gets the glory, the one that gets the worship, the one that gets the praise is Jesus Christ. Now, look, we can be thankful for men. There's a lot of men that serve. You know, I'm serving right now in the, with the preaching, the teaching of the Word of God. But don't forget, it's not about honoring man. It's thank God that I got to hear a sermon that helped me today. Thank God that the Word of God is being proclaimed. Give Jesus the glory. It's, he is the Word of God. Okay, we can't have the Word of God without Jesus Christ. We can't have the preaching of God's Word without the Holy Spirit working through the preacher and touching the hearts of those that are listening. Okay? Everything, especially the church, must give glory to God. Jesus Christ has the preeminence. Now let's jump down to verse number 24 there, Colossians 1, 24. Because when we learn about a church, yeah, it's made up of, we know that it's made up of believers, it's made up of those that want to give Jesus Christ worship, but also... Uh, it requires ministers. Ministers are required to work in the local church. Look at verse number 24. Now who rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now look at this, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister. Paul was made a minister. Now, before we keep reading, you must understand that all of us, and I'll, go into, I'll show you this later, all of us have been called to, to minister in this church, okay? But when Paul is saying that he has been made a minister, this is something where he is to serve the, uh, the body. This is where he is taking a position of authority in that body to minister, to serve, to preach the Word of God, to teach people the Word of God, right? So we're all called to ministry, don't misunderstand, but there are some that are just referred to as, as being put in place to minister, that means that it's their job to work in that local church. Okay? And we came to the Apostle Paul. He went about establishing church to church. He was being sent out by his local church um, in... Oh, where was he being sent out from? I forgot. Antioch. He was being sent out by Antioch, and he went out and establishing other churches. Okay? He was this minister to the Colossian church. But let's keep going. According to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you... To fulfill the word of God. So God has given uh, Paul a special dispensation to serve, uh, to me, for you, right? To serve the local body. Verse number 26. Even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So Paul's job was to reveal anything that may seem mysterious, any kind of mysteries in the Bible. It was his job to make it clear. It was his job to make it plain. And that is the job of the preacher, to come behind the pulpit and make clear what the Word of God says. Okay, That's what Paul has been called to do. Verse number 27. To whom God would have made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man. So this is the job of the minister who's been put in place by God for a church. What is it? To preach, to warn every man, to teach every man. Look at this. In all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now for the men, for those of you guys that came on Friday and I was teaching you about the job of the preacher and where I wanted you to get, so I showed you a graph and I said, look, this side, the y-axis represents your knowledge, it represents your wisdom, and then the x-axis, right, that represents your character, right? What we see there in verse 28, it says, teaching every man in all wisdom, so you've got to gain knowledge, you've got to gain wisdom, that we may present every man perfect, and that's your character, that's how you behave, that's how you act out your Christian life, right, in Christ Jesus. And so it's the preacher's job to help uh, people in the church to know what Jesus Christ is asking from you so you can live that perfect life and perfect doesn't mean sinless it means complete you have everything you need to be able to serve jesus christ at your full ability okay so i just want to show you that there's a body made up of believers jesus christ is the head of that body and within that body jesus christ appoints ministers to teach and to preach and we'll soon see that these ministers have authority all right now please turn to hebrews chapter uh actually no you turn to Psalm 22 for me. Go to Psalm 22 and verse 22. You go to Psalm 22 and verse 22. And I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 2.12. Now you go to Psalm 22.22. You look on that page 
as I read to you Hebrews 2.12. Because they're very similar. Okay, you look at Psalm 22.22. And in Hebrews 2.12 it says, Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Hey, I read to you from Hebrews 2.12. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. What did you, what did you read there in Psalm 22.22? In the midst of the? In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So you see, these are parallel passages. It's been repeated for us in the New Testament, and it's defining to us what the church is. The church is the congregation, the congregation of believers, okay? Church is not a building. I love this building. I think it's wonderful. We've got to fix it up. We've got to put carpet. We've got the painting done. We've got this image up here. Everything looks cool. Right? It looks wonderful. But this is not the church. All right? When I say, hey, let's go to church, I'm not thinking let's go to 250 Fairfield Street, Fairfield East. When I think let's go to church, I'm saying, hey, let's get together with other believers. That's what church is. Amen? Amen? Church is not some universal church where there's uh, some believer out there that I've never met before. I don't know his name. I don't interact with that person. No, a congregation is an assembly. It's a gathering of God's people together. This is why a church is at a local level. Okay? We're not some denomination. We're not, we're not just part of some greater group of churches or, or some man in charge. No, Christ gets the preeminence and every church is made up of local believers. Okay? And we ought to come together. We ought to have a congregation. We ought to have a love for one another, right? It's, it's a bad thing that if you come to church and, you know, there are people in that church that you do not interact with. There, there are people in church that you don't even know their names. Now, look, we don't have that much of a problem because we're a smaller church, but I've been in a church where it's larger. You don't even know half the people in that church. You've never spoken to that person in the church. It's not really operating like a church if it's working that way. Okay, we're meant to be a congregation. We're meant, you know, we've got our own lives, we've got our own families, we've got our own jobs. We're, we're, we're apart, but then the church is about coming together, right? To give Jesus Christ the preeminence. So it is not a building. Church is also not a legal documentation, okay? Now, we're registered with an ABA number, right? And we've got, you know, we needed to do that to uh, get insurance. And uh, many times when you need to hire a hall, they need to see all the paperwork. They need to see your legal status, uh, all these things. Some churches get into the, uh, become a charity so they can claim back uh, GST expenses or, or get other benefits by becoming a charity. But you know what? All that documentation, that is not the church either, <laughs> okay? That is not the church either. That stuff just helps you function in today's society, you know, today's needs where the government may need certain things or you might, you know, to hire certain things, you know, making sure they can protect people. If someone has an accident, there's insurance to cover the cost so, you know, it doesn't destroy the church or things like that. Those things, I guess, are needful, that they're in place. But brethren, at the end of the day, we are not a document. We are not just some words on a, on a government website with an ABN number, okay? You know what? If, if one day we, we you know, we didn't have a building. If one day, we, you know, it, it was, it's dangerous to have that kind of level of documentation where people are trying to force you, what you're, what you're allowed to preach in the church. At that day, we just give up on the church. Oh, sorry, we give up on the building. We give up on the documentation. And we still can get together any place, any public place, anybody's house, and still have church. Because it's the people that make up the church. Yeah. Amen? It's the congregation that make up the church. Now, can you please... Turn to Acts chapter 7 for me. Turn to Acts chapter 7, verse number 37. There is a false teaching about the church found in many of our Baptist churches. Who has heard of the term the church age? Can I just see a show of hands? The church age. Wow, okay, everybody pretty much. Right, the church age. Now look, the idea behind the church age, this comes from dispensational theology, where it says, well, in the New Testament, you know, after Christ resurrected from the dead, and they try to pinpoint exactly, they try to figure out, you know, at some point the church started. Either they believe it started when Christ was resurrected from the dead, or they teach that it happened on the day of Pentecost, you know, when they had the Holy Ghost come upon them and they went preaching the gospel. You know, and some people have different ideas as to when did the New Testament church age start. Listen, the church age did not start. It's always been. The church has always been. 
people coming together to worship God, to, to give Jesus Christ the preeminence, to worship God, that has always happened. We, we didn't just turn a corner, now it's time for church. Now God wants to deal with a church age. And listen, that whole church age thing is no different to the understanding of Roman Catholics. They create this, this monster called the church age and they say every believer is part of the church. That's not what a church is. A church is not every believer, local churches of believers coming together. That's what a church is. Amen? This church age idea is, is crazy. They do not believe there was a church in the Old Testament. Because they say, well, where in, you know, if you read the Old Testament, where does it say church? It says congregation. That's what it says. It's got the, it says the house of the Lord. That's what it says. Every time you read the house of the Lord, which was the temple or the tabernacle or Bethel, you know, back in the old days, that was the church. People coming together, offering their sacrifices. We come and offer our sacrifices of praise. We come and serve God when we come to our local church. It's just that like things have changed a little bit between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But, you know, to, to believe there was no church in the Old Testament is crazy. You're going to tell me there was not a time when people came together to worship God? You read, just read your Bible. It happens over and over again, okay? Now, you're in, uh, uh, what, what did I ask you to turn? Uh, Acts chapter 7. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse number 37. Acts chapter 7 and verse number 37. <clears throat> this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us. What was the church in the Old Testament? There was a church in the wilderness. Who was pastoring that church? It was Moses. Moses was the pastor of the church in the wilderness. God's people, hey, that was, a, that was like a, probably like a three million member church. That's a huge church. Praise God for that church. I don't know how Moses did it. You know, he, needed, he needed some help. But look, there's no difference. What did he have to do? It said that uh, God set him up so they would hear Moses. What did Moses do? Uh, it says that um, he went up to Mount Sinai with our fathers, look, who received the lively oracles. Moses received the word of God, right? To give unto us. Moses was a preacher. Moses was teaching and preaching God's word. Moses was the minister of the church in the wilderness. Just like Paul was when he was going out starting churches, many, many local churches, okay, in the New Testament. Well, the Old Testament, we have a church in the wilderness right there. And again, did Moses have a building to meet in? They had a wilderness. They were out in the open. Did he have an ABN number, brother? Did, he, did they have insurance paperwork to make sure they didn't get, I don't know, stung by scorpions or something? No, right? That was still a church, regardless of all those things. Okay? So listen, there was a church in the Old Testament. Very clearly, when the people of God, when Israel would come together to worship God, that was the church. All right? Now please turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. And if anyone wants to be a pastor, let me encourage you to study Moses. Moses was the, the very first pastor. Okay? Now he had a lot more responsibility. Not only was he the pastor, he was also the government. <laughs> okay? I mean, he was everything. He, he, he wore a lot of hats, that Moses, right? But if you want to learn what it is like to be a Moses, how to be a humble man that loves the people of God, just study Moses' life. And even when God is angry at his people, you see Moses step in and make intercession for them. You know, Moses had a love for the people. You know, Moses was a people person, yeah? And he was a leader. He was able to lead such a great congregation. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. And this passage just completely demolishes that false teaching of the church age, okay? Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, uh, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So, the ch was there, is there a church age there, brethren? 
Are you ever going to open your King James Bible and read about the church age? It's never going to happen. The closest you're going to find is this passage, and it tells us that there was glory in the church for Jesus Christ throughout all ages. All ages. Old Testament, New Testament, before the Old Testament, there was always a church brethren. There was always a place where people would gather, not a place, but people would gather to worship God. Every age had a church. And it says, world without end. What is that telling us? Without end, there's always going to be a church. In eternity, there's going to be church. Okay? We're always going to have a time where we get together with believers to worship our Lord God. Okay? And I'm going to show you that church uh, very shortly. Actually, I'm going to show you it right now. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22, please. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22. I want you to see this one, so I'll give you a moment to turn there. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22. So we saw that there was a church in the Old Testament. Okay? And if you remember, when Jacob would go and worship God, he went to a place called Bethel, okay, which was, used to be called Luz. And there he would worship God. Bethel means the house of God. Okay? That's where he would go to worship God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22. And then we saw the New Testament church, which we're all part of right now, brethren, this local church here in Fairfield East. We're that church. But there comes a time, world without end, for all eternity, that we're going to be back in church. You said, what are we going to do in heaven, Pastor Kevin? Well, we'll be going to church. Okay? We're going to be learning God's word even more. You know, we're going to just keep learning. We're going to keep gaining knowledge. What a great thing. I like learning new I don't know about you, but I like learning new things. I like it when I open God's word and, oh, wow, I didn't know that before. I didn't notice that before. I didn't realize that before. Well, we're going to be doing that for all eternity. Okay? I mean, God has all knowledge, you know? So it's going to take us eternity to learn what God has to teach us. But in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it says, But ye are come unto my, Mount Zion. But look at this. Is this Mount Zion on the earth? No, it says, And unto the city of the living God. Is that the city of Jerusalem on this earth? It says here, The heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Hey, there's going to be a time when we're going to be together with the angels. Look at this, verse number 23. To the general assembly. Hey, what's a church? It's the assembly. It's the assembly. It's the congregation. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Wow. Mount Zion in heaven. In the heavenly Jerusalem, we're going to be gathered together, all believers, with the angels that serve God, right? And we're going to worship Him at church. We're going to learn at church. I don't know, guys, get, get up here and start preaching. Maybe God's going to call you to come, and, uh, come up and preach a sermon in heaven. Who knows, right? But listen, we're, we're in heaven, in all eternity, church has a place. The point I want to drive home there, and I think I've driven it home more than enough, there isn't just this church age brackets. They call it, it's, it's just a bracket. It's, it's a time out time. Uh, God's just dealing with the local church right now because he's put Israel... Listen, Israel was the church in the wilderness, Okay? <laughs> There is no church age throughout all ages. World without end, we're going to have church. I can't wait for the General Assembly. I don't know what that church is going to be called, right? Well, I guess that's the name of it, the General Assembly. The church of the firstborn, okay? Firstborn. So it's everybody that's been born of God. Everybody that's in Jesus Christ will be part of that church. Hey, what's going to be great about that church in heaven, there's not going to be any tares amongst the wheat. It's all going to be the wheat. It's all going to be the sheep of God. Okay, it's all going to be believers. Okay, we're not going to have an, there's not going to be an opportunity for some false prophet to creep in, teach us heresies, and try to take over a church and lead it into wickedness. Now, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 17. I realize in my notes that I've, I've lost a, a, a verse that I wanted to teach, but anyway... Uh, it, it was one of the verses that basically say that God has given each of us a gift to serve in the local body. You know, all of us have been given some gift from God we can serve. You know, for some, it's, it's the preaching of God's word. For some, it's just to edify believers. You know, it's to be a help. It's to be a prayer warrior. We're all given different gifts 
by God to serve in this local church. And I haven't got that verse with me right now, but that's okay. But you go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 17. Because even though we've all been given a gift to minister in the church, as we saw with Paul, some people are set up to teach others. Some people are set up to instruct others. Some people are set up to start churches, right? And this is where the idea of authority comes from. Even though we're all ministers, some ministers have been given authority, okay, in the local church. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well. Now let's stop there for a moment. If you're talking about someone that rules, what are you saying to that about that person? That that person has authority, okay? He's got authority. He's got to rule over others. And so within a church, there are others that are under the authority of the elder. Now the elder is another way of saying the pastor or the shepherd. The reason we use the word pastor today, it's because it's the Latin form of the word shepherd, okay? Another term that gets used in the Bible is the bishop, okay? And the bishop is the overseer. It means that you look out for the souls of others, okay? And this is the person that's been given authority in the church. Let's read it again for number 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Look at this. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So the one that has, resp- uh, sorry, that has authority in the church, the one that is to rule in the church, has to labor in the word and doctrine. Okay? So listen, when I prepare my sermons, brethren, I'm not here, like I've said it many times, I'm not here for 10 minutes. I'm not here for 15 minutes mucking around, putting some verses together and, and preaching fluff. You know, when you're laboring, it means you're working in, in, in word and doctrine. I used, to be, I, used to think, I used to think I was in church. And I guess because the preaching, a lot of the preaching wasn't edifying. A lot of the preaching, I wasn't being fed in church. And I'd be like, man, this man gets behind the pulpit. I'm thinking about my Baptist Union church. And uh, I mean, these, these sermons are boring. I mean, how much time has he spent preparing these sermons? Maybe he's copied it from someone else. And this guy's getting paid for that. Yeah, but you know what? You, what you don't learn, like, this is, what, this is how a child thinks, right? What you don't understand until you actually put a sermon together. This is why I encourage men. Hey, men, if you want to get up to preach, let me know. The reason I encourage men to do this is because when you are looking at the Word of God and you say, well, I need to prepare something to preach to God's people, you start to understand how much work it takes. Like, if you want to preach a sermon that helps people, that edifies people, that feeds people, you know you need to spend a lot of time laboring in His Word. Okay? And you're just sitting there, and sometimes, brethren, I'm just laboring. I'm not even writing anything. I'm just thinking. I'm just meditating. I'm thinking of one verse, and I'm thinking, how does that apply for us today? Or I'm thinking, hey, that sounds a lot like this other passage in the Bible. Let me go and find out what that passage says, because maybe that adds further light to what this passage of the Bible says. I mean, all of that time, right? Just studying, thinking, praying, asking God, give me wisdom. Lord, help me uh, teach your people correctly because I don't want to make a mistake. All that labor is behind the scenes and nobody sees it. And you think the pastor gets just behind the pulpit and just says a few words and, man, that guy gets paid for that. Yeah, you know what? If he's not feeding God's people, he does, I, I don't believe he deserves to get paid. You know, if he's just given 10 minutes of, of a preparation, why is he there? Why is he there? But you see here, the, the one that rules well in the house of God is to labor in word and doctrine. All right? He's got to have knowledge. He's got to impart that knowledge unto others. Verse number 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So you see there that the elders, you know, biblically speaking, are to be paid. They're to be rewarded for their labor. Right? Verse number 19, and look, you know, I, I don't say that, I don't like preaching that because I don't want anyone to get the idea that I'm just like in it for the money. And look, do I, need, do I need to get paid to look after my family and feed my kids and all pay the bill? Of course, okay? Of course, but you know, it, it, it can take a long time to get to that point where you can actually provide yourself serving God, okay? Because we live in a nation that doesn't like God. We live in a nation that it takes a long time to get a church started, get people invested, and for people to go, wow, you know what, I'm being fed by, by the Word of God. I want to give to this work. You know, I want to make sure my pastor doesn't go hungry. You know, it takes time for that to develop. You know, it doesn't just land in your, in your lap, okay? But you can see here that pastors are called to be paid. And then it says in verse number 9, actually, let's go back to verse number 17. 
It says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. I haven't got time to explain this to you, but the honor there is, of course, making sure that his needs are met. And it's not just making sure that his needs are met, but he has double that. So he has more than what he needs, the double honor. That's what he's referring to, okay? But that's only for the elders that rule well. If you don't rule well, you're not deserving of double honor, okay? But then there's a flip side to that authority, okay? So you've got the authority, you rule well in the house of God, you get paid, you, you know, you even double honor if the church can afford that, right? But then there's a flip side to that. And look at verse number 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So what that's saying, that if someone has something negative, nasty to say about the pastor, okay? Let, let's say someone comes up to you, oh man, I've got to tell you something really bad about Pastor Kevin. Okay, I found out he's in some really bad sin. Okay, that's, that's okay. You can discuss that, but make sure you do that before two or three witnesses. Now, if someone comes to you behind you in your ear, oh, Pastor Kevin, blah, blah, blah. Say, well, hold on, we need some other witnesses. And if others can't listen to this, I don't want to listen to that. There's got to be two or three witnesses, right? Now, if the pastor has sinned, and we discussed this in the men's Bible study, if the pastor has sinned, all right, and it's, you know, you've gone out and you've confirmed this is correct, you've got two or three witnesses as well, you know, the several people have checked the evidence, this lines up, he's done wrong, maybe he's disqualified himself. In verse number 20, it says, Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Listen, pastors are not allowed to get away with extreme wickedness. Okay, I can't say pastors are not allowed to get away with sin because we all sin. But I'm saying, you know, especially if you get to a point where you disqualify yourself, pastors are not to remain in power. Okay, the church is to come together, we'll look at the evidence that's at hand, you know, and do the best to rebuke that elder. Hopefully that elder will be embarrassed, step down, and look, it says rebuke them before all. Why? Why is that important? Oh, we don't want to hurt his feelings. Look, that others also may fear. Man, the pastor's messed up his life. The pastor's made this mistake. We, we better make sure we don't make those same mistakes. So you've got to call out the pastor when he does wrong. Okay? Yeah, they're worthy of double honor, but they're also worthy of double shame if they disgrace the office. All right? Now, I, I, don't, I don't want that to happen to me. All right? I have a fear of God. I, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to get into some filthy sin. I don't want to disqualify myself, right? Because, you know, if, if I knew that I would be ashamed and I'd be rebuked before all, hey, that, that, that at least would kind of make me double, you know, think twice before doing something extremely wicked, right? Then instead of getting away with certain things. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 7. So the point I want to show you there, brethren, is that there is authority in the local church and it's the elders it's the it's the elder responsibility uh to to rule well all right and if they do well they're worthy of double honor hebrews chapter 13 and verse number seven hebrews 13 and verse number seven it says remember them which have the rule over you so who did we see who has the rule over you in the church the elder the pastor right the bishop Remember them who have spoken unto you the word of God. What is their job? To speak to you the word of God, teach you the word of God. We've seen that already, right? Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Again, the conversation there is your lifestyle, your behavior. You know, the pastor isn't just someone who should uh, speak eloquently and, and give great speeches and preach great things, but his life should also demonstrate that he is someone who is faithful to God. Right? His, his house has to be in order. His wife needs to be a, great, a good woman, not out there gossiping and backstabbing people. His children need to be in order, not, not you know, involved in, uh, in, in horrible sins and, and running wild in the church. Right? You've got to look at that person's lifestyle. You know? and, and that's another. Another thing that gives me great fear, right? because if people are looking at my life, looking at my behavior, and trying to pattern themselves after that, I can't let down everybody. You know, you, you mess up as a pastor, you let down the whole church. Okay? But I want to show you there that, once again, there is a man that has the rule over you in the house of God. Let's drop down to verse number 17. Verse number 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you. So, brethren, look, this is the word of God. What does it say? You've got to obey me. You know? If you like me as your pastor... Listen, if you think I can't obey the pastor, I can't obey the man of God, then let me encourage you. I don't want, I don't want any problems. 
Just find a church, find a pastor that you can obey. Because that is your command. Okay, that is your command. I would rather you just leave the church, pastor, I don't think I can obey you, when, when you and, and I'm going to find myself another church where I believe I can. Well, fine, do that. It's better. It, it works out better. Because I don't want to have to have problems in the church, right? But look, there is a need for obedience, right? That's what it, it, It's very clear. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Again, what is submission? It means someone has authority over that person that has to submit to that, right? Submit yourselves. Look at this. For they watch for your souls. That's what a bishop is, an overseer. You're watching for your souls. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So if you can't obey me, brethren, find another pastor. You have my blessing. Find another church. I'm not mad at you. I'm, I'm just I'm being honest with you. Okay? Because I don't want to have to give a bad account of you to God. When I have to stand before God and give an account for this church, okay? I don't want to say, well, you know, brother, who can I use? Brother, what's the name that we haven't got? Oh, brother Matthew. All right. God, brother Matthew made my life so hard. You know, I asked him to do things in church. He wasn't obedient. I told him to leave. God, I told him to leave. I said, go find another pastor that you can be obedient to. And he just wouldn't do it, Lord. That's not going to be profitable for you, brother. <laughs> Thanks for being the guinea pig for that. Okay? I was trying to find some other name of someone that we haven't got in this church. But anyway, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? You can see there that the pastor must give accounts. So who's accountable for the church? The pastor's accountable. Who is, it, who is he accountable to? He's accountable to God. All right? And the members of the church should be submissive to that person that has the rule over them. That's the proper structure. As we've seen the Decently in Order series, there's always somebody that has the rule, and there are always those that have to be submissive to that rule. Whether it's government, whether it's church, whether it's your workplace, whether it's the family. This is the order of God. Even the Trinity, we've seen, Jesus Christ is submissive to the will of the Father's will. Okay, so it's not an evil thing. It's, it's God's nature. And that's how he's put the powers into place in this world. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 1. First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 1. The elders which are among you I exhort. So there is again the word elder. Now, now I'm going to show you how this ties in with being a pastor or a bishop. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So Peter was an apostle but he was also a pastor. He was also an elder of a church. Okay? He says that he was the, the, the pastor of the church in Babylon. That's what he says. In the, anyway, I haven't got time to go through that right now. Who must an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look what he says in verse number two. So this is one pastor speaking to other pastors. He says, feed the flock of God. How are we to feed the flock of God? We saw with the Word of God, right? Laboring in doctrine, in, in the Word and in doctrine. Okay? Feeding. So if you're feeding the flock, what is that referring to? A shepherd and the sheep. Amen? It's the shepherd's job to make sure the, feed, the sheep are being fed. Alright? So there's the shepherd. And again, the Latin uh, word for shepherd is the pastor. And that's why today we're so used to using the term pastor to refer to the person that rules in the house of God. Okay? But again, who has authority? in that description. Does the sheep have authority over the shepherd? Or does the shepherd have authority over the sheep? The shepherd has authority over the sheep. So that's, that's the, again, it's the same idea. Hey, the, the pastor is called the elder. The elder. And look, we know that that's not referring to some, uh, someone that's necessarily old, though it could be. It could be someone that's old. But when it's talking about the one that rules in the house of God, it's the one that has spiritual maturity. Okay? And so the pastor ought to be someone that, you know, has lived a, a, a long Christian life, who's got a lot of experience, right? He's got a lot of leadership abilities, you know, and I'm not trying to talk myself up. And that's the last thing I want to talk about. But that, that's what the man that it ought to be. Someone that can be the elder. And what's the difference between, you know, what's the, what's the opposite to an elder? The younger. All right? The younger. The younger. So the younger in the faith, right? And so again, if you were to put together into place, you know, you, you had an elder person or a younger person, it's the younger person that's called to give honor to the elderly, right? To, to the one that's older, the one that has the experience. Again, it's not, you know, the Bible doesn't teach us that the elderly should honor the youngest, you know, the youngest. No, it's, it's the other way around, okay? This is talking about spiritual maturity. 
All right? So again, you see that framework. Let's keep going. There in verse number uh, 2, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Again, we saw oversight, that's where the word bishop comes from. Bishop means the overseer. So who's overseeing the, the church? The pastor oversees. Is it the congregation that oversees the pastor? No. The pastor is given the title overseer because he's watching over those that are under him. Okay? So you, you can see how very clearly, whether it's the elder, whether it's a shepherd, whether it's a bishop, those, uh, those titles, that job is always somebody that's over those that are under him. It's not the other way around. Okay, in the word of God. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Okay, now let's go to verse number three, because the next thought is, well, what if my pastor is you know, asking me to obey stupid things. What if he's coming into my life and he's telling me who I should marry, what job I should take, you know, he's, going, he's checking my bank account to see if I've given my tithes and my offerings to the church. Listen, I would never do something crazy like that. I, I would never do anything crazy like that, okay? But we know there are some pastors that overstep their boundaries. Where is their authority? Is there authority in your home? Is there authority in your workplace? Is, 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 is there authority over your wife and your children? No. The pastor's authority is in the church. It's in the congregation. It's the local uh, assembly. When we come together to praise God, that's where the pastor holds authority. Brother, one day I might work for you. You might have a business, right? And you need an employee and I need to work a job. Okay, maybe. I might go and work for you. And guess, what? guess who's in charge when I'm working for you? You're in charge. You're, you can't just go, well, Pastor Kevin, you, you've got, you know, the Bible tells me to obey you. Well, yeah, but that's a church, <laughs> right? In fact, I've had a pastor once work for me, all right? And yeah, I honor him as, as, as a pastor, but at the end of the day, he's working for me. I'm his boss, so I'm telling him what to do on, on the workplace, okay? There are proper structures. There are proper institutions. My authority is in the church, and that's it. That's it. I don't want to look after your family. I don't want to go into your job and tell you how to do your job. I don't want to tell you who to marry. I don't want to tell you when to go on holidays. I don't want any of that, brother. Please keep it, you know, make the decisions for yourself. You know, if, if you're a man, if you're a husband, if you're a father, you decide what is right for your family. You don't need to check it with me, okay? When it comes to church, though, I ask that you please obey those that have the rule over you, okay? It'll make all our lives a lot easier when, that's, when that happens, right? But look at verse number 3. Neither as, 1 Peter 5, verse number 3. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. So I'm not here, even though I have the rule. Remember, I am ministering the church. I am a minister. What, is, what does the word minister mean? The servant. I'm, a ser I'm serving this church. I am not the lord of this church. I'm not, I don't come here so you can serve me. Oh, Pastor Kevin, do you need your shoes polished? You know, and sometimes you guys come out and you, you know, you've given me gifts and you've done nice things for me. Brother Ramzan buys my lunch almost every time. I have to tell him, stop doing it. But here's the thing. When we go and have lunch, we're not at church anymore. So he doesn't have to obey me when I ask him to do that. <laughs> he still pays for my food sometimes. I, you know, thank God for those that do nice things. I appreciate it, right? But listen, you're not here to serve me. I'm here to serve you. And part of that work of service is to have the rule in the house of God. Okay. So, there is one Lord. There is one head of the church. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not Pastor Kevin. It is not anyone else. Look at verse number four. And when the chief shepherd, so again, we see the chief shepherd, right? The pastor is a shepherd, but there's a chief shepherd, even above the pastor. When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Brethren, I want that crown of glory. Hey, this is a special crown that's given to elders, that's given to shepherds, that's given to pastors. I want that crown of glory, all right? So I don't want to lord over you. I, 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 don't, I don't want to serve you for filthy lucre. You know, I, I don't want to disgrace my, my office here and, and commit some grievous sin. I, I, I want to rule well. I, I want to, I want to uh, feed you the word of God because I want this crown of glory. That's what I want. You want, you want to know what I want, brethren? That's what I want. Okay, if I get a kebab once in a while, that's great, but what I really want is this crown, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that's what I really want, okay? And so I don't want to mess things up. But the point is, it's very clear there, 
that the pastor has authority in the church. Okay? Now, let's go to... Uh, if you guys can turn to... Um, uh, where can I get to turn to? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I better hurry up. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verse number 1. 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now look at this. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband, hey, not, not a woman, he's got to be a husband of one wife, hey, not divorced, not multiple wives, one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Apt means aptitude. You've got the ability to teach. Not given to wine, nor striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Now look at verse number four. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So before you can be allowed to be a pastor, you have to have at least proven yourself that you can rule your own family, your own wife, your own children. They're not going crazy, right? Once you've proven yourself in that institution, then that is a person that can step into an office of a bishop. Okay? The office of an elder, the shepherd. Look at verse number five. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Once again, who is ruling? It says if a man know not how to rule his own house, why? Because he's also got to rule that church of God. Right? How shall he take care of the church of God? What is that saying? That if you're not a leader, that if you can't manage your family, if your wife is not submissive to you, if your wife is the one running the show, if your children are not obedient to you, if your children, dis, you know, they don't listen to dad, you're not going to be able to manage the house of God because it's going to be even more difficult. It's going to be even more challenging. Okay? Your family is like that stepping stone. You do well as a family man, then you'll be able to do well in the house of God. All right? So you see that that's the, the pastor's role. Now, please turn to, uh, let's drop down to verse number eight. Verse number eight. Verse number eight. There is another office in the church that holds some authority, and that is the role of a deacon. Of a deacon. Now, I've served, before I became a pastor, I served two years as a deacon. Okay? And it was great. I learned a lot of behind the scenes things as I was serving the church a lot more faithfully uh, and do a lot more for the church and things like that. I served in many capacities. I was a Sunday school teacher, Sunday school superintendent. I, I'd be preaching once or more every month at church. And of course, as a Sunday school teacher, you're, you're preaching every week basically to children. Okay? So I was able to get a lot of skills uh, through that. But many times, the office of a deacon uh, today, you, it, it's kind of like that they're not given the, the full authority that we see in the, house, in, in, uh, in the Bible. Okay? Because the deacon, and I haven't got time to go through this, you can read about it in your own time in Acts chapter 6, but the deacon was there to help, okay, help the ones that do have the rule in the house of God to, to manage affairs, to manage the administrative tasks of the church so that the apostles could be able to get out there and, and preach the word of God, to labor in the word of God. Okay? Sometimes when a church gets too large, you need extra hands. Okay? And this is where the deacon steps in. All right? But there in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 8, it says, likewise. When it says likewise, it means in the same way. We just finished talking about the, 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 uh, the, the pastor, the bishop. So likewise, the deacon ought to be pretty much like a pastor. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for filthy lucre. Look at this. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. So before someone can become a deacon, they must also first be proved. Okay? This is why you've got to serve faithfully in church for some time. Prove yourself. Show yourself able to be that person. Let that person also be pro uh, proved. Uh, where am I up to, brethren? No, verse number 10. Then, so let them be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave. Not slanderers. Sober. Faithful in all things. 
And what, what upsets me in so many independent fundamental Baptist churches, they're putting people in, into positions of deacons that aren't even married. You've got to have a wife. What in the world? What's going on? Okay? Why do they have to have a wife? Why do they have to have children? Because again, if they prove themselves to rule in their, in their families, they can have some authority in the church. You know, people are putting... I remember, you know, in my, I won't name the church. I was in a church and we were there to, to, you know, you're given a piece of paper. These are all the names that have been brought forward to serve as a deacon. And I'm like, well, this man has no wife. This man, I think, is even unsaved. Okay? Well, this one's married, but he's just he's a new believer. Right? I mean, it's like, are you, cra are you, are you crazy? We don't just put deacons for the sake of having deacons. They've got to meet the qualifications. Amen. Right? They've got to have a wife. They've got to show themselves... You know, leading a house. Even so, look, must their wives. They've got to have a wife. Must. Okay? Must have a wife. Be grave, not slanderers. Sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children. Oh, this one has one child. Children. Multiple children. Yeah. Why? Yeah, okay, having one child is challenging, of course. But when you have children, you know children argue and fight. So you have to prove that you can manage a household where children sometimes argue and, and, and complain. Hey, because sometimes that's what church is going to be like. You're going to have people with different opinions. People are going to clash. People aren't going to agree. And you're going to have shown yourself to be able to handle a situation where people aren't on the same page. This is the deacon as well. Okay? The deacon basically has to have the same qualifications as a pastor it's a disgrace to me when i see these deacons not married no kids it's like i'm a deacon haven't you read the bible haven't you read the qualifications how is it that you've proved yourself in fact you've proven yourself to not know the word of god how can you step into that position it's crazy to me it's insane i don't understand what's going on and then we wonder why our churches are suffering we haven't got the right leaders in place it's like the, this list is here so we can work toward that. But if you take shortcuts, well, you're going to get a shortcut pastor. You're going to get a shortcut deacon. That messes things up. These things are here for a reason. Right? Ruling the children and their own... Look, ruling their children and their own houses well, for they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Brethren, I want to elevate the office of a deacon. It's a great office, okay? You purchase to yourself a good degree. But our churches have diminished what a deacon is. Oh, anybody can be a deacon. You don't need to be married. You don't need to have kids. You don't give them any responsibilities. They're just some figurehead, just giving a vote, right? They're not given any kind of authority, any kind of positions where they're ruling things in the, in the house of God. You diminish it so, so lowly that people think, oh, just a deacon? Is that all? Just a deacon? Listen, you purchase to yourself a good degree, this is better than a Bible college degree. Amen. Okay? You want a degree in the house of God? Become a deacon. Aim for that. You know, for those that want to be pastors one day, aim to be a deacon, but not just a deacon, a deacon that is qualified in accordance to God's word. When the need comes up, it's a great office to have. It's a great office to have. Okay? Serving the people of God. So, brethren, in conclusion... The house of God is important. The local church is important. What is the church once again? It's the congregation. Okay? And we've all been called to minister, to serve one another. Okay? The person that gets behind the pulpit, Reverend, if, whether it's a pastor or some other preacher, then they're not there okay, to be served. Okay? They're there to serve you. Okay? When someone prepares a sermon, please, just have in your heart, this brother has gotten behind the pulpit, he, he, you know, he spent hours laboring the Word of God, maybe he's nervous, he's going to mess, I mess up words all the time, misspeak, he's going to say things that might sound wrong, and, uh, you know, but he, he's faithfully serving God, he's doing it for me, he's doing it to serve me, and so I better listen. I don't want to switch off, who's preaching this afternoon? Oh, it's brother so-and-so? Listen, who cares who's preaching this afternoon? You're coming to hear the Word of God being preached. That person has labored because he loves you, because he wants to serve you. Okay, but what else do we notice this? We notice that in a church, there's authority. The pastor has authority. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. It's a lot easier when someone has authority to call the shots and make hard decisions sometimes. 
Okay? And it is hard decisions sometimes, especially this COVID stuff. But what you are called to do, brethren, is to be obedient to that pastor. Okay? Make my life a lot easier. So I can give a good account of the church and of you because I want it to profit you in heaven. <laughs> you know, I want the Lord to reward you for being a faithful, obedient member of the church. You know, making the pastor's life easy and helping me out. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father.